I was an investigator at the National Cancer Institute. I was a clinical oncologist, and my life was interesting but routine. And then we started seeing patients who looked like uh, the one who is shown in this slide. We had never seen patients with whatever syndrome this was. It involved a fulminant form of Kaposi's sarcoma, in itself a very rare disorder. It involved very profound immunodeficiency diseases. It involved other forms of cancer. It was lethal and terrifying. And the survival rate for the patients whom we saw was very brief. No one had ever seen anything like this within the individuals I related to. Other institutions began seeing similar patients. And soon, with the help of the Centers for Disease Control, right here in Atlanta, it became very clear that we are in the middle of an epidemic. Now, one of my themes today is going to be the effects of false hopelessness. It's a theme that I probably will return to from time to time to illustrate why certain types of inertia can take hold in the scientific community as it attempts to respond to a public health emergency. The Kaposi sarcoma, which was a very prominent feature of the patients we saw, didn't merely involve the skin, as in the prior slide. It also attacked visceral organs. Here's a patient before and after a certain interval of time where you, in the upper segment of the slide you will see a somewhat normal x-ray and then in the lower half within a very short time the entire x-ray is essentially obliterated by the invasion of Kaposi's sarcoma. This was a very difficult time because we had a lethal and very, very uh, terrorizing disorder but we didn't know the cause, and we certainly didn't know effective treatments. So there was an interval of time in the early 1980s where there was a kind of chaos in the scientific community and in the community at large. We simply didn't have the right answers. That period of time involved a tremendous amount of searching and assisting other laboratories as they searched for the etiology of this terrible condition. Ultimately, it became known as AIDS. Then, in 1984, the Gallo Group, which was in a different building but close to where my laboratory was, discovered a new retrovirus, a kind of virus not seen in human beings previously in the lower portion of this slide, you will see an arrow pointing to this novel new kind of virus. Now, it's called a retrovirus because, as most of you know, the typical progression of information at a genetic level is from DNA to RNA. But this particular virus employs a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase and goes from RNA to DNA and then can integrate into the genome the DNA of the host cell, and then go through other cycles of replication. This caused a second wave of essential impaired thinking, because essentially the false hopelessness that one had hoped would disappear reasserted itself with the belief that this type of virus, because of its capacity to integrate into the genome, because of its capacity to mutate rapidly, and because of the unlikeliness of having the ability to inhibit the virus versus damaging normal target cells. All of that led to a kind of false hopelessness, which in some cases was paralyzing to the scientific community. My laboratory undertook a program of pursuing the possibility that targeting the reverse transcriptase could make an impact. We felt that if we could develop drugs, perhaps false building blocks of the nucleosides that 
otherwise would be required for viral replication, we could stop the virus from replicating and thereby inhibiting damage while the virus was in a replication mode. We did not set out, nor could we have set out, to remove the virus from the human genome. This was beyond the technology that was available in that era, and we knew that. But we thought we would come up with agents that could inhibit viral replication without unduly damaging the patient. And as it happened, after a lot of work and collaboration with initially the Burroughs Welcome Company, but also other companies, we were able to select certain agents and administer them within our own group to patients who had AIDS. And we observed positive results. Even in retrospect, it's difficult for me to fully grasp precisely what the odds were of success in that setting. But after our initial human observations in clinical trials, early clinical trials, a large-scale randomized trial using a placebo control was undertaken using the first agent in this class called AZT for azidothymidine, a false building block which the virus, because it is not a discriminating virus, accepted as it did the process of replication and was thereby subjected to a termination of replication without harming the patient to an undue extent. This process took time, but we devoted our full energies to doing it. And what I'd like to show you now, doing a bit of time travel, is what the situation was like in 1987. The first drug that we developed was called azidothymidine, and it is uniformly abbreviated as AZT. When we started these studies, the death rate was extremely high. AZT was approved in 1987 by the United States Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of patients with AIDS. You can see in the upper left-hand corner a red rectangle, a dot, which shows you the starting point for the death rate due to patients with AIDS. These are figures from the Centers for Disease Control. And what we observed after the approval of AZT and with the clinical investigation of other agents, we observed this. This was a fundamental change in the epidemic. At the beginning of the process here in 1987, the death rate was almost 400 per thousand patients in a given year. That's an astonishing figure. With the introduction of active antiretroviral agents, especially in combination, the death rate dramatically fell. And you can see the changes here. When we first started these studies and we first got interested into this entire program, no one believed this was going to be possible. There were projections that it would take at least 20 years before an agent was available to be tested. In my view, this represents essentially a unique experience in the history of clinical trials. This is a chronic and lethal virus, and in virtual real time, the introduction of effective antiretroviral therapy brought the death rate, the death rate, down by a dramatic effect. We saw other things very early on as we proceeded with these studies. Here's a patient who on his left side, on the left side of this slide, shows extremely poor glucose metabolism, glucose uptake and metabolism. This is using a positron emitted tomography. The patient also had serious cognitive impairment. After the administration of AZT, you look at the right-hand side, Glucose metabolism picked up, shown in yellow and red, and the patient cognitive function dramatically improved. We especially saw 
positive effects in children with HIV AIDS who had very severe central nervous system abnormalities. And by the administration of appropriate agent, they could restore their intellectual function to the normal range and also derive other benefits, such as a restoration of normal velocity of growth and other manifestations of improvement. So this, again, was a powerful repudiation of the false hopelessness that had essentially, in my view, impaired the entire field at the beginning. This is my laboratory in the late 1980s. Over my right shoulder is Hiroki Mitsuya, who was an exceptionally gifted researcher and could handle enormous workloads in the development of special testing systems that were able to define a window of opportunity. We didn't only develop AZT. We developed two other agents in short order. Over my left shoulder, standing at the extreme side of the slide, is Robert Yarchwin. His job was to take the observations and move into the clinic, and he was an exceptionally gifted clinical researcher. But I want to make another, two other points about this slide. One, this sl slide represents a relatively small lab. Now, at the beginning of any research endeavor, such as what I'm talking to you about today, the size of the group may not always be intuitively obvious. At the beginning, sometimes one may want small numbers of individuals, all working in a cohesive and effective way. Later on, as scale-up occurs, one may want larger numbers. The precise figures will vary. But it is important to realize that more is not necessarily better, especially early on in research. And one other thing I want to emphasize. In my lab, there was a coordinated effort of individuals who held citizenship in four different countries. And we worked together as a unit. And I believe it is important to recognize that international activity is one of the foundation stones of science. Here is one of the tremendous surprises. This is taken from an article by the uh, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. What it basically says is that undetectable means uninfectious. Now, there are very sensitive laboratory tests based on polymerase chain reactions that can tell the level, the extent of a virus in people today. That test was not available to us at the beginning, but it is today. If one can reduce the viral load, the so-called PCR viral load, to zero in a durable way, or undetectable in a durable way, it means that the patient can no longer transmit the virus, even with a condomless sexual interaction. No one, in my view, in my recollection, had predicted this outcome. This has enormous public health implications. It means that for many patients, not only will they benefit themselves if they take their medications, and that's a critical requirement, but they will contribute to a public health advance by no longer transmitting the virus to others. I cannot stress how important this more recent observation is, and I believe it could not have happened without the foundation stone of the earlier work I gave to you. My laboratory was responsible for two other agents and their FDA approval in sh relatively short order. But it took seven years for the next agent that did not come, did not arise from my laboratory. So there is a cautionary note. Sometimes one can advance, but then other advances can relatively come later. And I think this is an important point to stress. Progress does not happen in a straight line. It may take time, particularly if clinical trials are part of the equation. So I think this is a, a, a there are two lessons here. We tried early on in this pandemic to keep as low a profile as possible. We did not want to engage in unwinnable debates. 
We did not wish the endpoint to be a publication which is never read by anyone and has no impact. We wanted the data that we generated to speak for itself. And also, we wanted to make an impact in a very specific way. So we didn't engage in the kind of destructive fights over whether the virus can be treated or cannot be treated. We simply wanted to show what we could show. However, by 1987, the word did get out. And we had a special visitor to my lab. And this is, of course, President Ronald Reagan, who got word that something in the United States government within the public health service was working. And he was technically the head of the whole thing. So he came to our lab. Shortly thereafter, I was appointed the director of the National Cancer Institute by President Reagan. As I sometimes say, nobody's perfect. <laughs> he nominated me, and I accepted the nomination. Some have said he should have quit while he ahead, but nevertheless, I became the director of the National Cancer Institute, and that was a unique honor of my life. And I believe that it, the nomination and appointment was in large measure due to the success of the AIDS story. In 1992, I recovered a letter that I wrote in 1992, and it is to illustrate a point. This is my portion of a letter that I wrote to a then young biotechnology company interested in developing new drugs. And in this letter, I encouraged the chief executive officer of the company to get into the AIDS story and to develop a very promising agent and a combination of agents that his company had. This is in 1992. The company was not large, and it had some financial difficulties in that era. I even offered to study that company's drug in our own clinics. The point I'm making is that when you succeed, it's important to help others to succeed and to give back to either your own organization or to the entire field whenever that's possible. And for those of you in an additional point of view who are in medicine and particularly entering a field in which you may be doing clinical research, you may wish to think about the following. When you make important discoveries, you are in the room, metaphorically, when any a patient is given or administered the fruits of your discovery. You are in the room. You are metaphorically seeing more patients than any doctor can see in his or her lifetime. And so I believe this story was a success on a number of fronts. I believe we were a good antidote to the inertia of the era and I think this has led to a very significant advance. And I thank you so much.